Something is wrong with the Chinese economy. You can see it at job fairs, in rows of empty, half-finished apartments, and in the conspicuous absence of Chinese tourists everywhere. Take unemployment, for instance. In just a few short years, the number of 16 to 24-year-olds who can't find work has more than doubled, from about 10% in 2019 to more than 20 this summer, before the government simply stopped publishing data. If you think the Nasdaq has had a rough couple of years, just have a look at the Chinese stock market, which has lost about 40% of its value since 2021. Or how about real estate? Last year, Chinese land sales reached their lowest level this century. One especially desperate developer is enticing new home buyers with $70,000 worth of, I kid you not, gold bars. Consumption is down, deflation has set in, and for the first time in our lifetimes, its population has begun to shrink. The question is no longer when, but whether its economy will surpass America's. For the past two decades, most agree that the West is declining and the East is rising. But increasingly, it feels as though the East has risen. Are we witnessing peak China? Sponsored by Nebula, the exclusive home to my original series, China Actually. The 2008 financial crisis should have been disastrous for China. The United States is its largest trading partner. Thousands of Chinese factories and millions of workers rely on American consumers, who suddenly found themselves out of work and on the hook for mortgages they couldn't afford. Yet by 2009, China was back on track. It was, in fact, the first major economy to recover. While the US, Japan, Germany, and the rest of the world contracted, China's economy actually grew, and by nearly double digits, no less. Ten years later, China was ground zero for the COVID-19 pandemic. This time, supply and demand were disrupted. Factory and service workers had no ability to work from home. But once again, Beijing defied expectations. It not only weathered the storm, but was, as before, the very first country to recover. Soon, its exports soared to heights never before seen. In short, no one has ever won by betting against the Chinese economy. So how does China do it? It's simple. When in doubt, it builds. Roads, bridges, skyscrapers, stadiums, airports, whatever this is. It goes something like this. First, Beijing makes borrowing money laughably easy. It lowers interest rates and drowns state-owned enterprises with generous subsidies. When money is free and losses socialized, you'd have to be an idiot not to build highways, bridges, and tunnels, even if they lead nowhere. Much of this investment, obviously, is unproductive. But it creates jobs and raises the country's GDP just the same. Now, for a long time, this whirlwind of construction actually made sense. When Deng Xiaoping rose to power in the 1970s, China was poor, underdeveloped, and in desperate need for even the most basic infrastructure. The simplest two-lane road or single-story school was a massive improvement from nothing. Just to catch up with the rich world, China needed to build first and think later. In 2009, Al Jazeera ran a story about Ordos, China's eerie ghost city in the desert. Here, in this empty Potemkin village, it proclaimed, was irrefutable evidence of a housing bubble. Today, Ordos is quiet but far from empty, with about 2 million residents in total. More recently, in 2017, CNN published this image with the headline, China's Metro Station in the Middle of Nowhere. Readers around the world laughed at this hilarious white elephant. Then, a mere two years later, the station had transformed into this, and laughter was replaced with awe. 
More often than not, critics were wrong, and demand eventually caught up with supply as millions migrated to cities. And yet, this can't go on forever. By definition, to maintain economic growth, China has to keep investing more and more. Meanwhile, the returns on that construction are getting worse and worse. This is China's capital-to-output ratio, essentially how productive its investment. 20 years ago, it took $4 worth of construction to generate a $1 return. Today, it takes about 12. China is already a middle-income country with rich country infrastructure. With 25,000 miles of high-speed rail and 3 million miles of highway, it's simply running out of things to build. With nearly every obvious opportunity exhausted, China is resorting to increasingly questionable projects. This, for example, is the tallest bridge in the world. At 1,800 feet above the ground and measuring 2,300 feet long, it's an architectural and engineering marvel. Impressive? Absolutely. Economically sound? Doubtful. It's located not in Shanghai, Chongqing, or Hangzhou, but in China's equivalent of rural Mississippi. Guizhou is the fourth poorest of the country's 31 provinces and provincial-level cities but its per capita GDP of $7,700 hasn't stopped it from building about 500 new bridges in just two years, many of which are among the world's tallest. Now, perhaps this $150 million bridge in the mountains will be the next Ordos or metro station, quote, in the middle of nowhere. Perhaps it will spring to life and transform the local economy. Given China's track record, it would be foolish to bet against any one project. But it would also be foolish to think this could go on indefinitely. Think about it like this. Taking on debt is perfectly normal. Sometimes that debt takes years to generate returns. Also perfectly fine. But when debt continues growing faster than GDP, we know there's a serious problem. Previously, China would build, say, a new airport, represented here by an increase in debt, and it might sit empty for a time while demand for flights caught up with supply. We might read articles in the meantime about this wasteful ghost airport. But after a few years, we'd inevitably see a corresponding rise in GDP, represented here. So far, so good. Then, starting around 2009, we start to see debt and GDP diverge. Here, debt is still boosting GDP, but by a lot less. We can see this more clearly by dividing the debt line by the GDP line. The two grow at pretty much the same rate, that is, sustainably, until 2009, when debt starts growing much faster. At that point, China keeps building more highways and airports, but demand never catches up. This is the dilemma China finds itself in today. The old model, the only one it's ever known, no longer works. Now, there are only four ways to increase GDP. Investment, which, as we've already seen, isn't a viable option. Government spending, which is more or less a constant and exports, which the US and other countries are actively trying to reduce. That leaves only one route forward, consumption. In other words, China needs to somehow convince people to spend more money. And needless to say, gentle persuasion is not something the party has been known to excel at. As you can see, not only has it thus far failed to do so, but it's actually made negative progress. Chinese consumers spend less than 40% of their GDP. Americans, by contrast, spend nearly 70%, Europeans over 50%, and the average global consumer 55. The main reason is real estate. Until recently, buying property was the tried-and-true investment strategy for middle-class households. Save prodigiously, pool together money from family, and every urban couple could buy an apartment, or more often, two or three, and live the Chinese dream. 
Most of these homes were sold before construction had even finished, allowing developers to immediately take these down payments and start building more. All it took, therefore, was one set of buyers to stop making payments last year, and the whole system came crashing down. For two decades, the country was taught that property was the only safe investment. Then, property stopped being a safe investment. No wonder Chinese consumers are worried. Now the problem is one of confidence. It's simple, really. When you receive your paycheck, how do you decide whether to save or spend it? Generally speaking, you spend it when you're confident you'll keep receiving more, and you'll save it if you aren't so sure. Well, Chinese consumers aren't so sure. In the last four years, they've absolutely stuffed their bank accounts to the brim with money and cut back on big, flashy purchases like cars, TVs, and furniture. They're still traveling, but mostly domestically. They're still spending, but mostly on sales. So, naturally, in order to incentivize purchases, companies are lowering their prices. These lower prices, and therefore profits, are leading to layoffs and reduced wages. Finally, these layoffs are making consumers even less confident, and as a result, less likely to go shopping, completing the cycle. Until and unless China interrupts this positive feedback loop, it will be forced to accept lower economic growth. Now, all right, let's put things in perspective. Between 1979 and today, China saw what the World Bank calls the fastest sustained expansion by a major economy in history. Those four decades were anomalous. They weren't sustainable, and they were simply never going to last. Its economy is still growing, albeit much more slowly. Its middle class is still 700 million people strong. And its military is still the world's second largest. China is not going away. To argue otherwise is to overcorrect from the prior era of optimism, to make the same mistake in the opposite direction. But the lightning-fast growth that led to speculation about an Asian century is going away and there's very little it can do. At the very heart of this slowdown are demographics. As long as the population was growing, China could build almost aimlessly, confident there would be a steady supply of bodies to fill every ghost city, airport, and highway. But as of last year, China is now actively shrinking. Its birth rate has already dropped to the lowest level in the world just 1.09 children per woman. And by 2030, the labor force is expected to decrease by about 1% every year. One of the great mysteries behind this demographic collapse is why China kept the one-child policy around for so long, until 2016. Surely, its leaders had to have known the population would begin to shrink. So why then were families still prohibited from having more children? Find out the answer to this question in the latest 20-minute 7th installment of my Nebula original series, China Actually. Here's a quick preview. This would make it the single most effective national policy in history, and anyone could see that it just wasn't going to work. This was no ordinary period in Chinese history. The most damning evidence comes in the form of cross-country comparisons. There's much more to this story. China actually is and will always be exclusive to Nebula, the creator-owned streaming platform. Nebula is also home to originals like real-life lore's deep dives into recent wars, modern conflicts, Wendover Productions' Logistics of X series explaining how things like coal mining and search and rescue work, and Real Engineering's beautifully rendered Battle of Britain. With a Nebula subscription, you also get access to Nebula Plus bonus content, Nebula First early releases, and Nebula Classes, where you can go behind the scenes with some of your favorite creators. You can get all that for 50% off by signing up for an annual plan with the link on screen now, or by clicking the link in the description. At just $2.50 a month, that's a pretty fantastic deal, if you ask me.